Uh, we'll start in five minutes. Thank you for your patience. Where are you going? <laughs> I'm all alone up here. I don't, I don't mind if you sit here, but... Um. I literally wore this to justify not getting a haircut. <laughs> I know you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. I need to get a haircut too, but at this point now I'm losing so much hair that it's... it's Mine is like tripling the length. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think like, but, but, but the longer it gets, the weirder it looks when you're... the more you fall. That's just the face. face. Sorry. Just the face. Yeah. Okay. I guess we'll, uh, all right, I guess we'll begin. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's four more than the audience that Kyle had last time, so I'm very flattered. Thank you. Uh, if it were like, what, seven less people, I'd begin to cry. Oh, eight, hopefully. Thank you. Oh, that's, uh, that's our cameraman right there. We have a camera in the recording. I'd appreciate if no one blocked it up. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. If you're in the field of view, um, the cameraman's name is Jerry. All right. Well, I know it's not Halloween today, that was yesterday, but I'm an adult, I can do what I want, and so can you. So my name is Luke Chu, or Skywalker, whichever you fancy, and this is an uh, introduction to digital music composition. So, um, who here is classically trained? Like, who here, regarding music theory, really knows their stuff? And you're just here to... Okay, so we have two people here to make me feel small. Excellent, thank you. Well, um, for this lecture, we won't be talking too much about uh, music theory or delving into any of the actual uh, compositional aspects. This is for, um, this is a more beginner lecture, but I hope you'll take something out of it. And, well, I haven't given a lecture in like three to four years now, and this is my first time lecturing in person, but hey, I'll try my best. Just here to have fun, get the energy levels up. So, a word on pedagogy. Pedagogy just simply means how one teaches. It's your teaching methodology. So this lecture is aimed at students who know nothing about digital music composition or the industry and would like to know where to begin. By the end of this lecture, students should be able to know how to start composing using digital audio workstations and be more familiar with the industry and what being a composer entails. And I will say that my teaching methodology is designed based on what I believe an audience would learn from most easily, and it works for me, but it may not necessarily work for you. And I will not teach anything outside of my area of expertise or experience as a composer. And thank you, uh, but kindly save your questions until the actual lecture is over. So conceptualizing composing. Traditionally, and I remember when I started out, we thought of composing more as uh, like Beethoven, Mozart, right? They had sheet music and they would write sheet music. However, for our purposes, this would require hiring musicians and recording their performance, and unfortunately, that is very expensive. I'm sure none of us have the budget to hire a full orchestra or a band at this point in time. So for our purposes, we will be responsible for all the content of the finished piece. So by the end, we'll be producing an audio file. And here's, I want to make, uh, here's the idea that I want to convey. It's that we are both the composer and the performer. So how do we write? How do we compose? Well, using digital audio workstations. Now, a digital audio workstation, or DAW, or a DAW, as they're known, is, according to Wikipedia, an electronic device or application software used for recording, editing, and producing audio files. There are many different digital audio workstations to choose from. Um, a popular orchestral one, an industry standard, would be Cubase, for instance. Um, I use Studio One that's more streamlined for um, beats and orchestral, but of course uh, sound, des sound designers, often they use Ableton and you have the popular one, FL Studio. Of course, most professionals would agree that any digital audio workstation will serve your purposes, it's just that some get you where you want to go more efficiently than others. And with that said, if your music isn't good and you think it's your digital audio workstation, well, uh, I have some bad news, it might be you. So when you're starting out, it's wise to search up digital audio workstations. You read their specifications, technical requirements, and research their purposes and their price and see what suits your needs best. And of course, I'm sure you'd be very happy to see free digital audio workstations. And we have GarageBand, Cakewalk, uh, Reaper, Studio One Prime, LMMS, that's open source, I believe, and Audacity. And Audacity, well, you can't really compose with Audacity, but 
um, for vocal recordings or, or recording audio files and all that. That will help you out a lot. Though I will say, though, uh, when you're working with free products, there's usually always a catch, and free and lower price digital audio workstations usually have their weaknesses and their limitations. Well, for instance, if you're um, some uh, free digital audio workstation, Studio One Prime, that's like a, a light version of the full product, and they won't, you'll only have access to the stock instruments or the stock plugins, for instance. You won't be able to use third party plugins. Well, how do you compose in a digital audio workstation? Well, you're going to need what's called a MIDI controller. But what is MIDI, first of all? Well, MIDI, it's a connectivity standard. So it's a technical standard that facilitates communication between digital music technology. Well, for example, in most practical terms that you will use is what's called a MIDI note. So um, when you're inputting notes in a digital audio workstation, you have these digital notes. However, these notes, it's simply data. They will not produce sounds on their own. However, the computer, your program will read it and produce a sound. It'll be associated with a particular sound, an instrument of your choosing. And the good thing about this, and the cool thing is, your MIDI uh, notes your data, the music that you've written in. For example, if you have like a melody and it's all MIDI information, you can change the instrument associated with it to try out different sounds. It's called auditioning. But the MIDI data is, is exactly the same. And to write music, you're going to want a MIDI controller. MIDI controllers, well, it's hardware or software that generates and transmits MIDI data to MIDI-enabled devices, according to Wikipedia, because I couldn't come up with a better definition. So you, you may want a MIDI keyboard. That's the most efficient and easy to use in most cases. It's convenient, and it's as opposed to any inputting notes manually in your digital audio workstation's piano roll, so you can play into the program, just like playing a piano. And you can also connect a sustain pedal to your MIDI keyboard for extra functionality. There are also other, other MIDI controllers, such as synthesizers, faders, drum pads, etc. So I have a MIDI controller myself. It's not very good, but it has, um, as you can see in the image, there's what's called a drum pad, and you can tap on it, and it's just like playing a drum. It'll input notes in that manner. Or, of course, you can stick to the keys. But how do you get sound? Well, you're going to need Plugins. Now, plugins, it's software integrated into a DAW to extend its capabilities. And in the industry, when we talk about plugins, often people simply say a VST. And it's often synonymous with VST, though this is generally erroneous because a VST is actually a format. So you could say that all VSTs are plugins, but not all plugins are VSTs. So plugin formats that you'll encounter, a VST stands for Virtual Studio Technology. So these plugins, they work only on, well, they work for Windows and the Mac OS, those operating systems. You have AU, audio units, they only work on Mac OS products, and AAX, which works on both Windows and Mac, but they work specifically for the Pro Tools digital audio workstation. So when you're downloading plugins and all that, you should, well, first figure out if you're, if you're uh, using a PC or a Mac, and then, so if you're using a PC, for instance, and you're downloading an um, an AU VST format, sorry, an AU plugin format, then that's definitely not going to work. It's just going to take up space in your computer. So what kind of plugins can you use to make sound? Well, sample libraries. Sample libraries, I describe it as a playable instrument that performs samples, and generally it aims to emulate real instruments. So for instance, a sample library, you have recordings of live instruments. They are recordings of real professional musicians, real players. However, those recordings are put into a, a sample player, and there is scripting and programming involved to make sure the, um, the audio recordings flow into one another, so they react the way you want it to. So if the sound a sample library produces is that of a real instrument, then the only significant difference be between the sample library and a real instrument is the fact that the sample library has scripting and is programmed. And thus, you could say that the quality, in terms of whether a sample library is good or bad, may be dictated by the quality of its programming. For example, in terms of articulations with, with sample libraries, for example, um, an articulation is a way you perform a note, a way you perform music. And for legato, legato is a big one that I look for when I'm looking for sample libraries with good legato. So legato is the transition 
between two notes. It's the flow. And for some sample libraries, they have very bumpy legato, or they have legato that simply isn't very convincing, right? So if the programming's bad, even though what you're listening to is a live performance, is a recording of a real um, instrument, a musician who played it, it'll still sound fake in some way. It still has that uncanny quality, and that's because the programming, in most cases, wasn't done very well. You know, you gotta smooth out those bugs. And another thing is consistency. Well, when you're when uh, sample library developers develop their sample libraries, they also need to keep into account the volume of each note. So when you're recording um, notes for the instrument, each one might be at a different volume. So during the uh, scripting process, the programming process, you want to make sure the volume is um, consistent throughout the entire product. Another is dynamic range, which is the difference between the quietest and the loudest parts of your audio, which in, which in this case, it's the notes that are played, or dynamic crossfades. A, dyna a, dy a dynamic is how loud something is played. So crossfading between high and low dynamics, it's, for example, if you have a uh, recording of a trumpet and the trumpeter is playing really softly, that would be called a uh, soft dynamic layer or a quiet dynamic layer. But if they're playing at fortissimo, then they're playing very loudly. It's at a very high intensity. And then that would be a high dynamic layer or a, a loud dynamic layer. Now, cross-feeding between them in a sample library, so you have the quiet layer and it fades. So the quiet layer starts diminishing in volume and the high dynamic layer starts increasing in volume. So that's the cross-fade. And so depending on how smooth the cross-fade is in your library, then it's almost as if you're listening to a, a, a real player playing. They're going from, uh, going from a, a, a low intensity to a high intensity all in the same note. Though, despite how much I talk about programming and how that's important, that's a very significant part. But of course, the sound of a library is also a significant factor in determining its quality. Well, for instance, do you like the sound itself? You're not going to buy a library with a sound that you don't like, right? And fundamentally, a library will sound more static than a real performance because it is playing back the exact same recordings. So for example, with a real performance, it is ephemeral, right? Uh, if someone's performing live, then no two notes that they play, they might be playing the same note in terms of intention, but no two notes are gonna be exactly the same, right? That's just how physics works. And so, the way they solve this problem with um, sample libraries, for instance, um, there's something called a round robin. Now, a round robin is a sampling technique where you record this, uh, where you try to get the same recording of the same intended performance. Sorry, the multiple recordings of the same intended performance. Well, for example, if I clap. You might think to yourself, well, all three of those claps sounded identical, right? And in essence, they were. But if you were to actually record them and analyze them, technically, those three samples are all completely different in terms of timbre, because there is no way that all the atoms and particles in my, in my hand, they all con made contact at the exact same point every single time, right? Even the air, even, even how, how particles in the air are situated at any given time. It's not going to be exactly the same, right? Unless you're in like a simulation. So with that, we have round robins, multiple recordings. And with libraries, um, libraries that only have a single recording. So they quite literally record a single note. And when you play that note back multiple times, it's, it produces something called the machine gun effect, where you, the ear isn't tricked. You know that the note being played back is exactly the same recording. And obviously, that is very unconvincing. So to solve this problem, many libraries have um, many notes, round robins that they cycle through. Decent libraries have four. With many percussion libraries, they have up to eight or 10. And obviously, the more round robins you have, the more convincing the, the, the cycling sound. It becomes very difficult to tell whether or not the library is real, uh, whether or not the instrument, the sound is from the library, or is played live. But of course, it'll never be on par with a live performance. And do keep in mind that most samples do not sound like how they would sound in real life. Well, why is this? Well, it's because during recording, sound may be run through gear. For example, microphones, saturators, etc., that color the sound. So if, you're, if you have a live uh, performance that you're recording, 
that sound is going to uh, sound a lot more natural to how we hear sound in real life, just like in this room. But if I were recording a sample library, let's say in a, in a concert hall, it will be run through gear and there, there's a marketing process, right? I'm, I have a vision in mind for the sound that I want my product to have, to evoke. And of course that will influence the timbre of the final product, which might not be the style that you're looking for. And of course some sample libraries unfortunately have flawed recordings. They may have unwanted noise, which had gone undetected in the background during recording or introduced by low quality gear, such as uh, if you're using a low quality microphone, then there might be a, a weird hiss or some hiccups in the actual recording process. And many libraries, when they set up the microphones, they may have phase issues. Phase just means when sound, uh, two sound waves make contact and they cancel out each other perfectly. But well, there are also other factors, of course, in, in determining a sample library's quality, such as the editing. So what do we mean by editing in terms of sample libraries? Well, if you have a note, and each note, obviously, you want it to play perfectly in time to when you hit that key on the keyboard. But that exact, well, for example, it's called a transient. A transient is the initial spike with the sound. So when I clap, and if you to analyze, um, that waveform, you'll notice it's, it's a, there's an initial spike, that would be the transient, and then it fades away, right? It's called an, that attack. Now that attack, depending on where you cut the sample, some libraries cut a bit too early. So when you play the note, the sample is triggered a bit too late. But some of them cut on the transient, which might be what you're looking for. That means when you play the note, it's played in time. But the issue with this is for some instruments, for example, with the violin, right, there's a bit of a, a lead-in for that initial transient. And often it's that little lead-in that provides a very a warm human quality to the sound that many people are looking for. And of course, if it's, it's cut too late, then you've cut off the transient and it's like, what are you doing? And graphical user interface, some libraries, they also have um, artwork, uh, for example, with, uh, with, with their marketing, they, they have um, box art, or when you open the product, there's there's an image or there, there's um, the company logo or, or just something. Now one, um, one might say, I know there's um, definitely composers in the world who, who they disregard, they, 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 don't, they don't like, um, they don't respect other composers' opinions regarding um, the artwork that a sample library may consist of because they're, they're thinking like, well, I'm buying the product for the sounds. I'm not buying it for the artwork of the library. I don't, I don't care about that. Well, here's the thing though. If you have a well-designed um, graphical user interface, often the artwork can inspire you, right? If you, for example, if I'm opening up a horror library, I want to see something very muddy, very, very grungy that evokes uh, the, the feelings of horror in me just through the GUI. So there, it's not just the sound that is important in terms of sample libraries. Often your marketing is also as important. And other offer features, well, many libraries, they have presets, they have built-in reverb um, and ADSR envelopes, et cetera. Um, ADR, ADSR stands for attack, decay, sustain, and release. So it's attack is the initial, as I said, the initial spike, the lead into that initial spike of a sound. And then you have your um, decay, it trails off a bit and you have the main bulk the main meat of the sound, which is the sustain, and then when you let the key go, that's the release. It trails off. And for many libraries, you can actually adjust how your um, note responds. So if you have a, a really uh, a long release, that means when you let go of the note, you have this very smooth fade out. So if you're doing something more pad-like, that might be useful to you. And if you're wondering how to purchase sample libraries, well, there are many, um, you may download sample libraries from the internet from various companies, vendors, and developers. Well, they used to, uh, back in the early 2000s, um, physical box editions of these sample libraries they existed, though uh, they were ubiquitous back then and obviously very, very expensive because this sort of technology be only became, um, I guess, ubiquitous about 10, 15 years ago, I'd say. Though, uh, yeah, box editions are really rarely sold anymore, but some companies do, like uh, Spectrasonics, for example. And samples are downloaded and stored in your computer, and they must be detected and performed by a sample player, for example, contact. And practically how you do this is you'd open the sample player in your digital audio workstation, load an instrument, and you can begin playing it, just like the image you see. That's contact, that's a sample player. 
and the instrument inside that is one of my favorite libraries, uh, Cinematic Studio Strings. And once you load that up, you can begin, begin hitting your notes on your keyboard and begin playing the instrument. Though I will say, when, in regards to terminology, when you throw the term sample library around, most people know uh, in the composing world, they know that you're talking about this sort of uh, sample library, a sort of a playable instrument that emulates uh, a real instrument. Though it may also be synonymous with the term sample pack, meaning a collection of samples, but saying sample pack, it's not usually associated with being a playable instrument. Just audio files, just individual samples that you see producers and beat makers use a lot. And you might be wondering, why are sample libraries so expensive? Because, you know, when I started out, it was, it was just like that. I thought, whoa, you know, in terms of USD, 200, 300? Back in the old days, someone even go up to like, a, what, 1,000, 2,000? Libraries have certainly gotten more, uh, more inexpensive over time. But for the average person, it's still definitely quite pricey. But why is this? Well. Thinking, thinking of it from the sample library developer's point of view, you have to book studio time. You have to hire the musicians, and they have their rates. You have to rent according equipment. You may have to hire a mixing engineer who's sitting in the, the booth in the studio monitoring everything. And you also have a, may have a person checking out for uh, just, just also monitoring. They're, they're checking if there's background noise, like if you're, if you're recording a, a very light uh, flute noise and something like a, like a truck drives in the background. That low rumble is going to disrupt that recording and that will be unused, unsalvageable. Though you can also denoise and post, but it's beside the point. And programming, and many libraries, they can take up to a year or two to record in studio. But then when it comes to taking those audio files, editing, editing them, cutting them, trimming them, and then programming them into something usable, the programming process for some libraries, big name libraries, they can take up to a year or even two perhaps, depends on how much care is put into that. And that's why it's so expensive. And with that said, $300 doesn't even pay for their lunch break for all the musicians and, and the people in the studio. So when I think about it that way, you know, 300, 400, it's not that expensive. Like it is, but it's just kind of the way the cookie crumbles. Another thing, uh, here's a misconception. A price of the price of a sample library, of an instrument product, does not always equate to its quality. Because, well, I know, I know of this developer who developed a um, sample library, and he talked about how, why he set the, the price of his library to $250. Because he said, if it were any lower, like $100, then you start hearing that sound everywhere. Like, it'd pop up. It would saturate the market. And thus, in a way, it would devalue the quality of the actual samples which is very strange because the actual sample itself hasn't changed at all in any tangible way. But it's, it's socially how we perceive it, I suppose. But if you set it too high, then you're really like 600, 700, some 1,400 and up, then you're telling the market that, hey, uh, my product is only reserved for the best of the best, professionals, if you can afford it. That's often how it works. And so when I see, um, when you see like uh, those videos online where they have like, um, as how does a, a, a free instrument compare to a ten dollar instrument, to a fifty dollar, to a hundred, to a three hundred dollar? Like as if as if the increase in price somehow, like as if the expensive one is somehow automatically better. Like that's not how it works. If you have a library that has a lot of instruments, for example, if you're buying, I don't know, a brass sample library, which has a may have a trombone, a tuba, a flugelhorn, etc. The price will go up based if, if the number of instruments, if the number of samples um, go up because there's additional labor costs. So the price will have to adjust accordingly. And though, don't fret, you know, when I started out, I also looked to free options. So there are definitely free sample libraries on the market. You just have to do a bit of Google searching. Uh, most big companies also offer free products. And do not fret, there are also student discounts, uh, edgy discounts, typically. 25, 30%, 40%, or even 50% off. All you have to do is contact um, the company you support, and just say, you know, hey, I'm a student, I go to this institution. And you don't even have to be a music student. Often, if you're simply a student at a recognized post-secondary school, hey, you can get a discount. And yes, there are sales. Um, Black, Fr Black Friday sales, summer sales, spring sales, I think, for some companies. But just keep an eye out. 
usually there's always something within your budget. Though you can also um, subscribe to, uh, there are sample library subscription models, for example, uh, East West Composer Cloud. Um, that's a popular one. Okay, another way to actually make sound is with a synthesizer. So a synthesizer is an electronic musical instrument that generates audio signals. And they typically create sounds by generating waveforms through what's known as subtractive, additive, wavetable, FM, modular, granular, synthesis, etc. And I don't use synthesizers that much. I don't make my sounds from scratch that often, so I can't really delve into these synthesis methods. But I will say, with synthesizers, they're, they're not recordings of real instruments. They are generating pure audio signals. So with subtractive synthesis, for instance, you have like a, a bed of frequency material, right? You have your lows, you have your mids and your highs. And with subtractive synthesis, you are cutting away, you are carving out a sound. And when you um, carve away frequencies, right? For example, you can um, lower the bass or, or, or cut out some of the mids to decrease some of the mud, etc. It changes the overall timbre. And timbre simply means sound quality to delve into it further. My voice has a certain timbre. And unless you are me identically with my vocal cords, you are, your voice isn't going to sound exactly the same as mine. It's, that, it's the sound quality. Or you have, uh, for example, an instrument recorded in this hall is going to sound drastically different than if that same instrument was recorded in a bathroom or your basement, for instance. It's the way that's, uh, that instrument, the sound waves propagate through the air and are recorded by the microphone. Just the most minute difference in your environment can make a big difference, even if the instrument, even if the source sound is exactly the same. Modeled instruments. Now, I don't, I've never used a modeled instrument, but these, they're not sample libraries, but they're also not synthesizers. They kind of are, but not exactly. Well, these products emulate the sound of real instruments. Now, how do they do this? They do this via physical modeling synthesis. Um, in short, it's when mathematical models, mathematical models simulate physical instruments and generate sound. So they're simulating like a real, uh, I keep like, a trumpet comes to mind, I don't know why, but a, a, a tr how a trumpet player would play, how that instrument is, is, is built, they would simulate that. And then when sound waves propagate through the air, when they vibrate the air, it's, they simulate how that would react with the surrounding um, environment. And also modal synthesis, I don't know how to explain that. And often AI processing is also used. So the good things about a um, uh, modeled instrument is that since it doesn't consist of samples, it takes less storage space. You won't need a bunch of hard drives and they're much less static. So what do I mean by static? Well, for instance, if I were to record, um, if I were to record an instrument right here, right now, that recording, every time I play it back, it's going to be the exact same audio file, the exact same recording. But with a modeled instrument, because it's computed, uh, you could say from scratch every single time, in, in theory, it will always have a slightly different timbre, so you'll never get the same sound twice. And with sample libraries, unless you're playing legato, if you transition from, for example, if you're playing short notes like staccato, and then you want to change your articulation, your playing style, and you go to um, playing long notes, sustains, it's that short note articulation and that sustain, that long note articulation, there's going to be that gap in between, in between them, right? But with a modeled instrument, it can just simulate that gap, right? If I were to play right now, the air from the first note is going to carry over to the second one and how the instrument would respond in kind. And though the problem is uh, because they're computed, uh, it may require heavy processing power. Uh, you're gonna have to have a, a decent computer for that. And they, because they fundamentally aren't live recordings, they may lack realism. To my ear, sometimes I'm fooled, sometimes I'm not fooled. So that's why I kind of don't use them. Recording is another way you can uh, write into your DAW. And recording is also known as tracking. So when you hear people say tracking, they really just mean recording. And if you have a microphone, it doesn't have to be high quality. If you have a microphone attached to an audio interface into your computer, you can record directly into your digital audio workstation or drag and drop files into your DAW. And as you can see that image up there, that's, those are the audio files. After you've recorded, they will um, manifest in that manner. Or you can record, if you have the budget and you're feeling fancy, you can record live musicians. And you can 
um, record directly, of course, into your digital audio workstation or drag and drop your audio files in. And overall, your piece may consist entirely of live recordings in the best case scenario, or live recordings and samples and synths. So a combination of both. Now, why would someone do this? Well, if your piece consists exclusively of samples and it sounds lifeless, unconvincing, clinical, oftentimes just introducing even a single track that's live recorded can introduce soul, warmth, and realism to your music. Well, for instance, I could, if my entire piece consisted of, of uh, uh, sample libraries or, or synths or just, they are live recordings, but they're not, um, they are sample libraries with sounds that are live recorded, but it's not like I, I hired like a, a, a piano player and they recorded their live playing from beginning to end and then put it in my digital audio workstation. There's a certain uh, lack of warmth to, uh, to, uh, to, to projects or songs that are, are consist completely of samples and synths. But for example, if I recorded just even with this microphone that I have at home, like a, like a shaker going because that, this is not programmed because this is a live recording, the human ear will latch onto that realism because there's an uncanny value, right, when you have uh, music consisting only of, of synths or samples. But with that one element, there's like uh, the ear will latch onto it, and in a strange way, it kind of forgives the, the sterile clinical quality of the rest of your um, composition. Or like I do, just use sample libraries and synths all the way through. Now we're talking about pure samples. Samples, uh, typically we're talking about audio files you can drag and drop and further manipulate into your digital audio workstation. If you're a uh, sound designer, for instance, you can drag and drop an audio file, you can time stretch it, you know, you can make it shorter, make it longer, increase the pitch, transpose, do all sorts of interesting things. And, and they may be sold through a sample pack, which is a collection of samples typically curated for a, tip, a particular style of sound or genre. There are many subscription-based subscription, uh, subscription uh, services that provide samples, Splice and Loop Cloud. I use Loop Cloud, and you can subscribe to that service, and you can uh, scroll through a, a, a database full of individual samples. And you can audition them, and if you like what you hear, download it, drag it into Digital Audio Workstation, and use them. And if you pay for it, then that sample is yours. You can make money off it. And they may be extensively used by producers and beat makers. For example, I'm sure you've seen YouTube videos of producers uh, using FL Studio. For some reason, it's always FL Studio. And they're making EDM um, beats, right? And they, you see these little snippets of audio. Those are samples that they've perhaps made themselves or purchased from a sample library, uh, purchased from a, 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 a company. And they would use those in their composition, which is a little different than MIDI, right? Because with MIDI, it's a... It's, uh, it's, it's a representation, but it's not an actual sound. But with samples, samples are the audio file. And though I do say producers and beat makers, a producer technically, I don't want to be flamed for this, may be defined as someone who delivers a completed recording to the artist's label that hired them. Or in other terms, they, a producer works with an artist to help them realize the finished product. Though colloquially, uh, I tend to just say, a lot of people tend to just say, you know, someone who makes modern styles of music, such as, EDM, R&B, soul, funk, they're all producers. But technically, there's a, there's a definition. And a beat maker makes beats, instrumentals, or backing tracks, and they may sell their beats. And unlike a producer, they're essentially a composer. Now, with a composer, you might think to yourself, well, why would a composer use samples if they already have sample libraries that they can just write in, write in their digital audio workstation directly? Well, they may use them to introduce variety. Well, for instance, when you're writing, you are writing, you're the artist, so everything, every choice you make is your choice, which is a very stupid thing to, stupid sentence to say, but there's some truth to this, because when you, when you have a, a gut instinct as an artist, when you uh, have a vision in your head, just, or trying to translate a feeling that you have, whenever you play a note, you made that choice. So no matter what you end up making, that music will, will have your identity in it, right? With every single composer, no matter how, how, um, no matter how different or contrasting you try to make your uh, musical pieces, for instance, like in one piece you might 
try to sound different. You might want to make something jazzy, and, and another you have something more, more classical. But the thing is, with every composer, there's always a through line that makes everything you've ever made sound like you, and that's because you were the one who made every single individual choice. Well, for instance, um, everything written by John Williams subconsciously will always sound like John Williams. Why? You might not be able to put your finger on it, but it, it just is. And so to use a sample, I use a sample um, because the recording that was, uh, the, the, the musical choices in that sample, for example, it might be a, a recording of a live performer, their choices, while it's not a choice that I would have made, but because I'm introducing um, someone else's musical choice, someone else's creative intent, that, that might inspire me to write a little, a little differently, right? And I might be able to learn from other artists or, or, or um, because the, the style within the sample is a bit different, then I can learn from that and broaden my horizons. Otherwise, everything I write will be Luke. And while that's good, I don't want everything I write to sound like Luke because it's like I'll end up cannibalizing myself. Um, creatively and inspirationally. So you always want to expand your horizons, right? Just take that one step over the line. And to write more quickly, well, lots of uh, composers get a flack for using samples. Or for example, if you have a hi-hat sample that goes Here's the thing. If, you, if that's what you wanted, um, if you wrote them from scratch with MIDI notes, using a, a drum library and you selected a hi-hat instrument and then you played t -t 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 in your keyboard and that's what manifested. If that was your intent, it's really no different than if you just downloaded a sample and then just had that. Like, it was the same intent. So I, I, I do not understand why many composers choose to be elitist about it. Like, it achieves, it achieves the same end and it's not like that t -t 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 pattern is somehow denigrating yourself as degrading your, 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 your work because you're all because you're using a sample. So it depends on how you use it, not because you're using it. And with that, you can write a lot more quickly because you're just taking what you need instead of writing everything from scratch or to introduce realism. So just like how I mentioned before with um, recording, it's because samples are all, uh, they can be, they can feature live performances within it. It's it injects that bit of warmth and human soul into an otherwise, into what might otherwise be a clinical composition. All right, uh, sound fonts. Now, sound fonts are a bit, a bit lesser known, and it's they, it's a file format that contains a collection of samples, and they function similarly to a sample library or a synthesizer. So basically, samples are triggered via MIDI notes. So. For instance, uh, retro gaming consoles, they had sound chips that produced a style of sound that became characteristic of a particular gaming console. For example, uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System, those beeps and boops, that has its own particular sound. So people can make sound fonts quite literally, right? It's like a, like a, like a typeface or a, a word font. It's a sound font. It's, you have a particular style, timbre of sound that evokes, um, that may emulate a particular system sound. And the good thing about sound fonts is, well, they're cheap, you can download them, and you can use them too. Or, of course, you can, the sound fonts don't have to be of a particular console or, or, or system or emulating something else or emulating something that already exists. It could be a completely unique sound, or, or they could attempt to emulate real instruments. And you may download sound fonts. Most of them are free, as far as I know. And they're cheap, they're accessible and they require very little storage space, and they're not heavy on resources. However, the sound may be static simply because they're lacking in the flexibility and liveliness that um, modern-day sample libraries may possess. They're generally obsolete since we have VSTs now, and they tend to be retro-sounding, but this is often what we want. Now, I have a colleague who uses uh, Toho sound fonts often, and everything he writes, it'll evoke that retro feeling, but since all his, um, all the notes that he inputs, his actual composition is entirely his. So you have this interesting, this interesting thing happens where it, where it evokes this nostalgic feeling, but it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like something you've heard before. There's an originality to it. Now with stock plugins, there are plugins that come with your digital audio workstation. They may be referred to as third party. So with instrument plugins, so sample synths and sound fonts that you may use, 
they may sound less realistic than I found with uh, stock instruments in, your, in a digital audio workstation and have limited functionality. And with mixing effect plugins, many stock mixing plugins are good and others might not be. I find that FL Studio has very quite excellent mixing plugins. Uh, same with if you're doing if you're interested in sound design, Ableton stock plugins are, are incredible for that. But with uh, what I find with Studio One, for instance, uh, the the stock instruments are a bit a bit lacking. Well, and they may also because they may color the sound in an unflattering way. For instance, uh, they may cause degradation. Degradation quite literally means the degradation of the audio. So, for example, I might have a pristine audio recording, but once I slap on a, a plugin like an equalizer or a compressor, that for some reason just makes it the audio sound fuzzy, lower resolution. And every plugin will introduce degradation. I just find that stock plugins, uh, they do something unflattering with the sound more often than not. But what are mixing effect plugins? Well, as I said, um, well, while instrument plugins process notes via MIDI and output sound, so there's an element of pitch, mixing and effect plugins process digital audio and they alter it, outputting an altered signal of what was input. So, as I said before, with EQ, reverb, or compression. Okay, now, what well, you've probably all been waiting for, let's take a look at a digital audio workstation. Before that, when you set up a new project, um, my recommendation is, when you set up a new project, set it at 48 kilohertz and 24 bit. So you have your sample rate and your bit depth. There are certainly reasons to use higher or lower sample rates and bit depth, but it's not something I find useful for the beginner to get into at the moment. So 48 kilohertz, 24 bit is ideal in most cases, and I'll get back to this in a bit. But for now, if you just do this, you shouldn't have too much of a problem going forward. So how to load instrument? This is in terms of loading tracks. <laughs> now, funny thing, when I first, uh, when I first got Studio One, I, I, was, I was very excited because I just had, a, I had, I had upgraded from uh, Mixcraft, which wasn't optimized as well as I thought, as well as I wanted to be for my purposes, because I tend to write a lot of epic music, often featuring 30, what is going on? 30 instrument tracks to 60 instrument tracks. And by the time I hit 60, I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that digital audio workstation some mercy. So I upgraded to Studio One. But once I opened it, I had no idea I'd even load an instrument. It took me like three days and I felt like an idiot the entire time. So how to do that? This is Studio One, and if you don't use Studio One, don't fret. It's because, well, uh, in this lesson, I'm only demonstrating things that are that I think are universal to every digital audio workstation in some way, shape, or form. So often, on the upper upper left-hand corner, you can just add your sorry, add an instrument track. You click that little plus over there, or uh, you can drag it in, and now you have contact. Now you can load up your instrument. I like so. Of course, if you don't want to use that method, you could just simply take your player, whether it be contact or something else, just drag it in and it achieves the same effect. And that's how you actually load an instrument. And when you actually begin, begin writing, you will be writing in uh, something called a piano roll. And the piano roll, well, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, they had these pianos that would play themselves. I'm not sure if you've seen one before. I have. They're very, very cool. And they would, well, a piano roll refers to a, a very long roll of paper with perforations, with holes in them. And then when the piano would detect these holes, it would play the note. And when you look at the holes visually, it looks like as such. The visualizations of your um, composition, of your writing. It's obviously a little more different. Uh, it's different than sheet music, than notation software. But as you're writing, I find this to be most uh, visually intuitive to me personally. And when you're writing, uh, one thing to keep in mind when you start out is uh, you might want to either turn on or turn off snap to grid or quantization. So as you notice with the, with the notes up there, it, excuse me, sorry. Uh, Okay, uh, with those notes above, they are snapped to the grid, right? They're not overlapping. However, this can create a very uh, clinical, uh, it sounds very computer-esque, right? Because in real life, even if, if I were to, even if I were to play as 
in time as possible. So to me, that was pretty in time. But on a very, on a very minute level, obviously they're not as perfect as a computer would have played that. So often you want to shift your notes off a little bit. And it might be just easier to write when you're dragging and dropping instead of just clicking into the, into the boxes. So if you turn off Snap to Grid, then you have more freedom with your note lengths and where you would like to drag or, or move them around or place them. Of course, you don't need to use a piano roll. You could use a drum, sequency, drum, uh, drum sequencer or a pattern editor, as they're often called. It depends on what digital audio workstation you're using. Or notation editor or score editor, as it's called. I, I, don't find, I don't find the score editor useful in any way, shape, or form, but uh, UDU. The drum sequencer is useful in most cases, but I find that the, the piano rule works just fine. And you have some cycles that like to use like, guitar tabs. I don't, don't ask me why. I don't, I don't understand it. All right. And when you're writing your notes, the other, before we were dealing with the axis of, of, uh, of time, right? It was, it was horizontal. It, it's it's, it's uh, how long or short each note is and to which pitch. That's, that's obviously the writing process. But now we have uh, two different elements, which is uh, two different aspects, which you have your uh, velocity. So velocity is uh, the intensity of the note or perhaps how hard you play the note. So with higher uh, velocity, if you want, for example, if you want, want the, uh, the player to strike the piano key really, really hard, all you have to do is uh, take that bar and then just drag it up. Or if you want to play soft, then just do the inverse. And with modulation, we have, um, it's similar to velocity. It also deals with intensity, but modulation is how a sound changes in intensity over time. So with this diagram, obviously, for example, if, if above, if it was a, a flute player, at first they were playing at a, at a moderate, uh, at a moderate intensity, and then they would enter like a forte, and at the end, perhaps a uh, fortissimo in a linear fashion. And for some libraries, pay attention if it has legato. To trigger legato, often all you need to do is just make sure your notes overlap, and your, and your sample library will automatically just have a transition between the two notes. So if you don't have legato, then it's really just a sustain note, and then just very static. Sorry about that. Very distracting. Okay. Okay. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so overlapping MIDI notes may trigger a, a, a legato transition. When it comes to the meat of it, it's arranging. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what do we pay tuition for, right? Uh, you said hitting it works, right? Percussive therapy, yeah, that's useful. Yeah, okay, you're right. Sometimes a good slap in the face works. Okay, so with arranging, and this is what it'll look like you have, we added the tracks there, right? So now you have different instruments for, for each, that's whatever. So we have our events, and for example, um, all, these, all these squares you see, they're called events, and you can shorten them, you can lengthen them, you can cut them up, you can split them, or you can move them around. Or if you want to write very quickly, you can just have a hotkey that duplicates uh, these events. So instead of writing um, from scratch manually from beginning to end, you can simply just write one thing, highlight the event, and then just duplicate it or, or remove it or do something called layering. Now, layering is simply obviously stacking one thing on top of each other. Now, in this case, with uh, the blue event, Notice how that's been duplicated and then repeated on the yellow, that the yellow event is the duplication. So that would be an instance of, of layering. So we have two instruments playing, uh, playing the same thing in this case. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, just gotta bear with me. Um, as we mentioned before, we can also record directly into your digital audio workstation that's represented by the green. So this would be active, actively recording and you have that uh, red red marker, which is um, which is expressing exactly where you are right now as it's recording. Or you can drag and drop samples. The blue things, those are bass drum kick samples, as you see. Now with that, that's my uh, that's my library. And you can 
uh, you can take a sample and come on, you can take a sample and then you can just drag it in. Okay, yeah, sorry, this is way too distracting. I don't know. Please bear with me, guys. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Oh, as in this. Yeah, yeah. Bear with me here. How's that? For it. Okay. Let's see if that works <laughs> better. Thanks, Kyle. All right. So. Is it just me or? <laughs> okay. Well, show must go on. So when you're um, when you're writing, I find that learning what bouncing is early on is actually rather rather useful. So when I first heard that term, I thought to to bounce. It's like what what does that mean? Bouncing just simply means rendering an event to an audio file. So the purpose of this is to save on resources. Well, you might ask yourself like, how is that the case? Well, as you can see with the first image, we have um, an event with two MIDI notes, which means every time your digital audio workstation is, reads those notes, it has to grab the associated, the appropriate sound, and then play it. However, that in itself takes resources, right? However, if you render it to an audio file, just playing the audio file straight takes up a lot less uh, resources. So if you're having, if you're writing with a lot of, if you're writing with a lot of instruments and you find that it's uh, taking a toll on your CPU and RAM, then often if you just um, render your MIDI data to audio files, it'll take a, 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 a huge load off. I'm going to revert back to the original. We could also try switching to the two projectors instead of one, and that might... Should, sure. I, should I do that right now? Okay. Yeah. Then it'll take a, a minute to, to heat up. So it'll, it'll nope. Sure. <sighs> anyway, okay. So with, with CPU, um, you definitely want... Um, a lot of CPU when you're uh, working as a composer simply because it processes and executes instructions, which is everything. Without, without um, CPU deals with, you, uh, with your programming, um, actually playing your plugins, uh, making sure they, they actually function. Uh, if you don't have enough CPU and you sort of hit the limit, then your whole uh, project will start sort of glitching out in a sense. RAM is important, though not, um, if I had to choose which one to prioritize, I'd say CPU, but RAM is also important because it is a memory that can be retrieved very quickly. And an example of this, um, in a practical sense, when you have a lot of uh, MIDI data and your uh, workstation is trying to read it, every time it's read, it will recall the samples that are stored in your RAM. However, if you don't have enough RAM or, or, it's, or it's full or something, basically your workstation will read the notes and not actually be able to retrieve the sound in time. So it'll just be skipping notes, even though you're, they're technically being played, but you don't hear anything. And once you're done writing in general, we'll, this is called a mixing console, this thing, or just the console. And this is where you do mixing, where you can add plugins to these channels. So to specify, up there, they're called tracks, and each track has an associated, a corresponding uh, channel. And on the channel, you can, you can see the little, little, little plus, or, or you can drag and drop your plugins inside, and they'll, they'll appear as inserts. And whatever you adjust to the plugin, for example, it's an equalization plugin. Equalization, it's, it's the balance uh, of frequency content of low, mid, and high. If you, in your equalization, equalizer, you, let's say you cut out the high frequencies, then it will alter the original audio uh, audio content that you fed it, and it'll spit out something that's altered, depending on what you did. Now with export settings. Uh, assuming your settings when you first set up the project was, as I mentioned earlier, 48 kilohertz, 24 bit, you want to export to WAV or WAV, W-A-V, 48 kilohertz, 24 bit. Here's the thing. If you set your project at a certain setting, if you export at a higher setting, you're, you cannot actually export to a higher setting than what you set originally for your project. So even though after you, after you export it and you analyze the file, it may, you, you might think, oh, well, I exported it at, I don't know, uh, 
96 kilohertz at 32-bit float. You might, think, you, might, you might think to yourself, like, that's, that's pretty high. Well, you did indeed export to that rate, but if your initial project settings were only at 48 kilohertz, 24-bit, then going over isn't actually going to increase the quality of your, of your um, audio. And why export to um, 48 kilohertz, 24-bit? This is the industry standard, and it's the industry standard as, because, well, 48 kilohertz, 24-bit is at a decent quality. And with WAV files, there's, they're lossless, which means they don't actually compress the data, compress the information. You don't lose anything. So it's as high quality as it can be. Well, technically, but for most practical purposes, it is at such a quality that you could, um, for example, you can, you can give it to your client or uh, put it in, let's say, a, a video software like Premiere Pro. And then when you export your video, you'll export to, let's say, an AAC format or MP3, as you've all probably heard of. And those formats, while not terrible, compression does occur, which means information is lost. It's, it, their truncation occurs. So you want your, basically, uh, as a principle, you want your initial audio file to be as high quality as possible because you can't go from a low quality file to a higher quality. You can take your higher quality file and then export it again or you know, shrink it down to a different, different size depending on, depending on your, your, your game or your project or to, to suit your needs. But 48 kilohertz, 24 bit. Just remember that and you will be safe in most cases. And of course, if you render to a, a lower, uh, if you export to a lower uh, bit depth, for example, 16 bit, when your original project was 24 bit, uh, it's gonna cause problems. You're gonna need to do something called dithering, but that's, we're not gonna get into that. Basically, whatever you set it as initially, export at that setting too. Now, hardware specifications for, um, as a uh, recommendation, do this line of work. For digital audio uh, or music production, an SSD, solid state drive, is highly recommended and is much faster than HDD, a hard disk drive. So f for practical uh, purposes, samples stored in, an, in your SSD will load much faster than if they were stored in a hard drive. And, you know, when I, um, when I was using a East-West products, uh, when I first started out, I didn't have an SSD yet. So often when I was loading a project, all my, all the, before we had like uh, the tracks, right, all the instruments, it took a total of 15 minutes to 20 minutes to load every time I loaded the project. And if you compose every day, you have 15 minutes multiplied by seven days a week, how many weeks a month, and then 12 months a year, how much time is wasted just on loading your project, right? And that goes for anything. So unfortunately, Sometimes you gotta spend money to save money, right? Okay, so you should now be equipped to freely produce audio tracks as you please, and hopefully I've um, armed you with the relevant information for you to be more autonomous to, to do all that, to just get started if you don't know what you're doing. And you can now essentially do what a composer does. There really isn't that much of a difference between what you could theoretically do now and what composers in the field do because at this point, you're armed with all the necessary resources and, and information. Though, from here on out, it's, it's, for example, the quality of the writing, right? It's, it's, it's polishing or it's uh, specializing in a particular genre or your own style or learning how to mix and master better, right? Right now, all this is, when you start from nothing, now you can at least create audio files. You can produce audio files and then hand them to your client or, or write music to your heart's content with confidence. Though you might be wondering, you know, when will I become a real composer? And so, for example, when, of course, this, this only this applies to me, I'm not sure, but I hope a lot of people, I'm assuming a lot of people uh, feel the same way. You know, as a, when you start composing, you're thinking, you know, uh, when can I be a Hans Zimmer, right? When can I be a John Williams? So, well, if you are feeling that way, if you question your own legitimacy in any line of work, well, let me soothe your possible apprehensions with a quote. You're not a professional if you're good at what you do. You are a professional if you make money from it. I, this is not my quote. I don't remember where I heard this quote from. I'm heavily paraphrasing. And I actually don't necessarily agree with it because obviously when we say professional, it, this is quite semantic. When we say professional, we, we mean someone with a decent level of competency, right? That's what makes professional. But if that were true, we wouldn't have modern day Hollywood now, will we? If every professional were truly good at what they did. So here's the thing. Obviously, I don't, 
I, I believe art should be art, though, you know, if we're being realistic, you got to monetize your work in some way. But if you're feeling, if you feel like a, an, an imposter, don't make that joke, or if you're doubting yourself on some level, if you can create a product that someone's willing to pay for, then you're a composer. You've done your job, right? You've delivered what was expected of you. And if they buy it, well, it can't be that bad, right? And so often when we think about being a professional, it's often more of a mindset than a, than a technicality in general. So with that said, here are some tangible ways to grow your career, or in other words, be more established, right? Because you see a lot of artists, you know, on, on your favorite artists on Spotify, you might think to yourself, how could I do that? Well, sign on to projects, right? So in this case, you're getting credits to your name. You can network. Well, for example, all my, uh, my clients, they're, they're all introduced to me by friends or associates, acquaintances, and many of my clients are or were people that I'm, I'm close to, that I could say that I'm, I'm, I get along with and I'm chummy, that I'm friends with. And it's through networking. It, it's, it's a reason why so many composers and filmmakers too, but many composers, they end up moving to LA because, right, it's Hollywood. It's where, it's where, where, where there are many opportunities and where everyone can, um, can talk to each other. They can, they can network, communicate, and just have a more tight-knit community. And once your name gets around, that's when commissions start piling up in an ideal world. And many, uh, some uh, clients or employers, they would request a demo reel. I never, I've never made one myself, but this is something that exists. And you can also begin taking commissions. So um, you can say like, I'm open to work. If anyone wants a piece of music or something, then you can just write it and make your rate. And a way that, how much should you charge? Well, some composers, they charge per, per well, per minute or how long the finished piece is. But of course, if your finished piece is, is, is only a minute, you might say that's free short. Yeah, but what if you have a hundred instruments to use? That's obviously gonna like, right, stack up linearly. That's gonna be a, quite a doozy. So another way to do it is multiply the number of instruments you use in your track by the duration of your music, right? That would make a lot more sense. And um, there's a rumor that Hans Zimmer might charges like up to a thousand or more per minute of finished music, but that's a rumor. Don't quote me on that. I just read that online. And you can distribute your work via distribution companies, such as, uh, you might have heard of DistroKid, CD Baby, right? Those companies, you can um, make an account, you can pay, pay the fee, or some of them, they're free, but they take a commission. For example, you might, if you made $10 off your song in a year, they'll take like a, like, Two dollars off or a 15 percent cut something like that and they distribute to youtube music right you have those topic channels or spotify and it's also uh, a popular one for for beginners it's soundcloud and bandcamp of course uh for those you can upload yourself or they don't really go through a company technically the soundcloud you can monetize via company but it's it's a little different so when you think about um, your aspirations or, or your role models or artists that you really like and you think, you know, how can I get to that level? The truth is you can start now. You can start today. And I will be very serious about this. Never work without a contract. No handshake deals. And what I mean by handshake deals is it's a verbal contract. In the eyes of the law, if it's not written down, if there's no evidence, it doesn't mean anything. Because We'd obviously, in an ideal world, we'd like to assume the best of people, like to assume that, you know, the world is full of good people. But the truth is, that is not true. Because people will take, many people out there, they will take advantage of you. You know, they'll, they'll try to short you, or they won't pay you what you're owed. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, Luke, well, that, that's very cynical, that's very, a very toxic way to think about people. And it is. But I believe it's realistic, because the real world is obviously different than these whatever post-secondary institutions are teaching these days or and all that. So do not work without a contract. And even if you had a contract, many people still get, excuse my language, but screwed over even if they had a contract. I mean, I'm sure you can look up the, uh, the, 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 the Mick Gordon incident. I won't go into that because, uh, but definitely a lot of me messy things can happen. So at the very least have a contract. So even if I'm working with a friend, if they're mature about it, 
we will discuss beforehand. We will have a serious conversation about what's my cut or what's the commission fee? What am I owed? Or what tracks am I going to deliver? Have that all clear cut. You know, if you can't answer very firmly, then you, have, then you don't know what you're doing. It's wishy-washy, it's up in the air. So if your client is mature, or if, even if I had a friend, it's like, this is business. Business is business, it's not personal. You, know, you, you figure that out first, and then you go back to whatever it is, whatever relationship you had. But again, work is work. Yeah, I just want to, I don't want you, uh, I don't want any of you to get uh, taken advantage of. And of course, this goes for any field, not just the world of composition. I know that firsthand. And if you don't treat yourself like a professional, why should anyone else? Of course, this sounds very much more negative than I intended it to, uh, to, to come off. But I, I do believe there's, there's some truth to this. Well, for example, I, had a, I was working with a, a colleague recently, a very talented um, composer, and we were creating a, uh, we, were, we were releasing a, an album where I uh, wrote a cover for, for one of his, uh, for, for his game. And we we're making a cover and, and I was uploading it to YouTube and, and doing all, all that sorts of stuff. And he said, wow, that is so professional. It's like, that's, he, he's, a, he's a humble person, right? And I'm not, I'm not like, like speaking lowly about it. I'm, I'm just saying it, it's often when we first um, take our first step into that sort of professional style of marketing. It feels, it feels very cool, right? It's like, finally, I, I'm somebody, I'm established. But there's always that little, that little voice of, of doubt in your head, right? It's a, you're, you're wondering like, if, you're, if, you're as, as, if you're good enough to be considered um, a professional by, by, by your audience. Well, here's the thing. It's good to be humble. You know, humility is probably a rare trait these days. I, I respect it very highly. But it does get to a point where you have to take that first step, you know, into the field. Say like, hey, I'm still learning, but I have faith in my product. And even if I don't, you know, I'm going to fake it until I make it. And once you start treating yourself as a professional, as someone worth respecting, other people will respect you too. At the very least, like, it'll give you a fighting chance. And another thing is regarding um, treating yourself like a professional is, I think on my level of whatever competency I have, it is very easy for me to turn out audio files every day, just, just write garbage basically. And you could just, like I, I see a lot of playlists like that or even on YouTube or whatnot. It's like, hey, if I, the more content I turn out, the more money I make. And even if it's just a little bit, of, even if people don't like it, whatever, it gets views. You know, I, 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 I can get some, get some income. And I think here's the thing. I'm not going to judge people morally, whether or not they, 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 like, it's like, hey, you, you, you submitted a work and you made money from it. That's valid. But at the same time, the truth is, Everything you make, no matter for what client or, or no, no, no matter, your audience doesn't care what happened during the production. Your audience doesn't care how much you were paid. You know, when you watch a movie, you don't care about th that they had low budget, you know, there were excuses. It's like, eh, things didn't work out. You don't care. You paid for the ticket. You're going to watch the movie. And if it's a bad movie, it's a bad movie. You're, you're not going to care. You're not going to be happy. Same with any art and the same with music. So if you're a composer and then you, you just churn out crap, it's like, okay, you made some money. But if someone stumbled upon any of your tracks and it would happen to be one of the bad ones that's the first impression of you and whether you like it or not often you have to make a choice money or your reputation and i don't care either way me personally i prefer reputation but i do admit there's a level of a uh, you have to be pretty well off to be able to reject projects but i will say this don't do anything that corrupts your soul don't for anything in life don't take projects that you don't feel good about taking. If it has a message that you don't stand for, don't do it. So, so if you ever wonder when you'll become a composer, I'd say, hey, think again. Chances are you already are one. I reserve the right to take back everything I said if presented with new information that changes my beliefs. Thank you. That concludes my lecture. And the floor is now open to questions. So uh, hopefully I can answer everyone if anyone has any questions at all. It's okay, I'm, I'm patient. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, start with you. Uh, I didn't quite understand the difference <coughs> between the different like, kilohertz that you were saying. Like, 
what makes it like that you want instead of the 24 kilohertz as the standard? Okay. Definitely, uh, definitely more in the. I was going to go into it more in the the mixing lecture if I forget to that, but it's okay. I can I can talk more about that now. Okay. Putting me on the spot here with sample rate. It's so if you have a, we all know sound is a wave, and a wave has a right has a crest, it has a trough, it is like like this right. If, perfect. Um, I don't know if you can see that at all. No. Okay. Again, where is our tuition going? I don't understand. Better? 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 Okay, okay. So you have your crest, you have your trough. I'm going to get too technical, but this is what we call a frequency. Why? Because it is the frequency. Well, this is, this is one cycle, right? And, and the, the shorter this is, we'd say if this was like shorter, this would be so this 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 would be higher in pitch, and that's why we say higher in frequency. Because given this uh, colloquially, I mean I don't know if this is the right terminology. Given this distance, if you have a lot, you can fit a lot more high frequency cycles, right, in this amount of space than this low, this this longer. One. So when we talk about sample rate, sample rate is the rate at which it's at which it, it's sampling the actual wave itself. So with a high sample rate, it might, okay, for the low sample rate, it might sample, right, it might have a point here, it might sample a point here, it might sample a point here. But with a, sorry, did I say high or low? With a low sample rate, it might, you know, it might sample one here, sample one here, one here. But when you actually reconstruct the frequency by the wave, by the dots that were sampled alone, what you get is something like, it might be something like, like this. Which, when you actually put it together, this is this is this is a broken wave. Like this, this doesn't make any sense. However, if you sample a lot more points, then you get a more right. The wave becomes much more more more, uh, more clear, more defined. So, with a higher sample rate, what that means is the higher your sample rate, the higher the the more accurately higher frequencies can be replicated, can be can be captured. Right, because when you, when, you, when you have, when you get to like the distance between the dots, everything in here, this is going to get lost, right? So that's the, the purpose of a high sample rate. Sorry, is I, did I, did I, what was your question? Or, or are you just asking like what, a sample, what sample rate kind of means? So I just didn't really understand like why would you would choose one higher. Would you, why, why wouldn't you choose one higher? Okay, that is, <laughs> there's, a whole, there's a whole thing about this. And it honestly is such, so, so interesting. Oh, man. But I don't know if I have the competency to, because I'm a composer. I'm not a, I'm not a mixer, but... I, yeah, um, I will say this, at 48 kilohertz, there's something called a Nyquist, Nyquist rate, which means, I don't know if I can describe it. Okay, the sample rate you choose needs to be at least twice the highest frequency of the, 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 the file that, of, of, of the audio that you're exporting. So if, 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 if the, 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 Sorry, it's putting me so, so on the spot. Okay, with 40, 40. Okay, so the human ear can hear up to uh, 20 kilohertz, right, I believe. Yes, so 20, 20,000 hertz. Okay, so if you want to choose a sample rate that can capture the full range of human hearing, well, as you, as you get older, you can, that diminishes down to 15, Thousand hertz, but for our purposes, 20,000. 20, that's the upper range of human hearing. And if you want to capture the full range, you need to double this. So if you double this, 20,000 obviously becomes 40,000. So your sample rate needs to be at least, uh, so in your digital audio workstation, we export that would be 40 kilohertz. And when, we, when, I, when I talked about the Nyquist rate earlier, this is kind of what I mean in more. Simplistic terms. I'm very terrible at explaining this. Uh, but so why 48? So if you have 48, you realize that's actually pretty overkill, right? That that is much higher than what is needed to capture the full range of human hearing. And in addition, by the time you're like, time you're like an old man. Sorry. Uh, like you can only hear up to like like I'd say, uh, if it was like 15 
kilohertz, like 15,000 hertz. So, but why would you use higher uh, sample rates? 96 is a, a, a higher one. 96 kilohertz. Even though 96 is overkill, for example, and there's an even higher one, 192 kilohertz. That's, 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 that's insanely high. But here's the thing. If, if you're doing a lot of um, audio manipulation, if you are going to, for example, uh, slow down your audio, what happens? When you take a high frequency pitch and you slow it down, why, right, when you slow down your voice, it becomes uh, very, uh, very low, right? That sort of effect. It, when we say it's lowered in pitch, it's lowered in frequency, it quite literally has. Because remember, we're taking this high, high frequency, and let's say you, 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 you slowed it down, uh, you, you slowed it down by, by, by two times. So that would be, right? It's slowed down, and thus this has lowered in frequency because it has gotten longer. So if by using a high sample rate, you can afford to stretch it. Because if you had a, sure, like 48 kilohertz is fine, but if, you do, if you're doing a lot of stretching, then by the time you get to, you stretch it to where you want it to be, you might have stretched the, 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 the sample points kind of thin. Right? So if you have a lot of them, then you, at least you can guarantee that you can stretch them however you want and you could still maintain that uh, wave. I hope that makes any sense. My goodness, I didn't think I could do it, but I think I did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, you had more, more, more questions? Yeah, uh, sure, you were second. Okay, so earlier you mentioned a section about um, uh, adjusting the offset of the timing, so for like the, the piano roll to make it sound more natural. Uh, what is a good way to, to do that while making the music loopable, especially for interactive music? Uh -huh. So uh, that's called hu humanization in, in a sense. So for example, if, you, if you're, with a lot of, um, I found a lot of beginners, uh, beginner, well, what a lot of beginners do when they're arranging is that uh, everything they make is perfectly snapped to the grid, right? There's a very uh, clinical uh, inhuman quality to it. So what humanization means, it is adding that human element. It is basically you highlight your notes and you can select a, a, a range of how much you want to shift each note. So if all your notes are perfectly on the grid, you can highlight them and then just with a snap of your finger, it will shift it. Just shift each note just a little tiny bit so that on the grid, clinical quality goes away. But you raise a good point, because when that happens, often be, when, when, you, when you loop something, you want to loop exactly on the beat, right, as, as you're saying. But when you shift that note just that little bit uh, earlier or later, it might get cut off. And the truth is, video game loofing, I was going to want to get into it in, in, in the video game lecture. But OK. One solution that, I don't even know if this is official, but something that I, I've, I've used, uh, which is you don't export all at once, or rather you can mute certain sections and just, um, exp if that makes any sense. Uh, okay, your, your, your saw might start here, you want the loop to start here, and you want to loop within here, even though the song technically starts here. but when you start looping here, there's, I understand what you mean. There's like that little, uh, uh, if, it, if, it sh if it shifted a little earlier, then it'll just cut that note off. Um, what I do is I, I, either you can cut it at that point and then do a little um, crossfade. Like do a little fade in with, a, with a, like, a, like, a, like a curve. And another way is to just, just not do that, just um, to render the whole thing. So you can mute this earlier stuff and then just, um, export that bit so a little bit earlier right so because you've because you, the note has gone a bit earlier than the actual um actual downbeat so you want to export a downbeat even one downbeat earlier and then it's in the video game um audio engine it's there that you can um manipulate it further sort of tweak it further so it's actually not something that can be looped uh on the spot i don't think that makes that makes any sense Right, because in, right, in Unity, you can put it in uh, that. Do you want to talk more yeah. about it? Yeah, or, or uh, in the game engine itself, you can specifically decide when certain audio files start to stop, and that could be one way to... Yeah, because in a perfect world, basically, in, in a, thank you, in, in a perfect world, we, we like our audio to loop perfectly on the beat. But obviously, that would require the, um, all the notes to be perfectly on the grid, which isn't necessarily possible. So. Either you cut it off or you include the whole thing, but it's after the fact that you 
program in some you know fade-ins or some transitions just to smooth it out but it definitely isn't perfect um, there's also something called a zero crossing point so with each right with each wave this is a this is the speaker this is the speaker pushing forward this is the speaker sucking in right the zero crossing point is that midpoint where there is no action at all it is it is at rest and it's at this point that if you cut right here to make your loop regardless of where you cut there will be no uh, no clipping because there is no there, there's no nothing happening at this point it's not like you have a wave and you're cutting it off and that sudden sharp drop creates like a like a click becomes a um, clips but at the zero crossing point it means no activity is happening and then thus there will be no clipping so you can loop there and it doesn't have to be on the grid you just have to really zoom into your audio file to see the actual wave uh, probably didn't answer to the best of your ability i'm actually not that experienced in um sort of looping audio for video games but that's that, that. It gave you something to think about. Yeah, uh, was that okay? Or? Yeah. Okay, that's best I could do. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have like, no experience with digital music composition, and mm -hmm. I know like, very little of music theory. It's just like one, one, two years of playing piano. It's more than I have. <laughs> but uh, I still, I feel like I don't know anything, but I do want to try uh, starting, and I was wondering if you have any tips or how to start. This whole lecture. This whole lecture was a tip on how to start. Wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, but how to start? You have any more? Anything more specific? Like any any apprehensions or just? Just in general, because like it's the first time I'm hearing about MIDI and DAW. It's mostly because my group, my team, doesn't have any sound designers, so I was thinking mm -hmm. I could step up. But I don't know where to start exactly, so I came here. <laughs> Find a free digital audio workstation. Find some free samples or free sound fonts or just some, some plugins that can make beep, beep, boop, boop noises in your digital audio workstation, or stock plugins, things I've talked about early in this lecture. And you don't need a keyboard. You don't need to have one, but it's, 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 it's useful to have one. For example, there's, like a, there's, a, there's also miniature ones that aren't weighted. They're about, about yay big, or you can have your full 88 keys. Mine isn't full 88, but it's kind of in, at the midway point, and they're semi-weighted. But in any case, you don't need a MIDI controller. You can still input each note right into the piano roll by hand. And it's very tedious, but you can definitely get by, right? And that's how you could start inputting, you know, that's how you can start writing, at least in a tangible sense. Mixing and all that, like, hey, always prioritize your writing, your arrangement, because you can't polish a turd. It doesn't matter how amazing you mix your music, if the original thing isn't arranged very well, then it, it's all for naught. So, um, and then just, as I said, you just um, select where you want to export and then export and then you have your audio file. Um, in terms of sound design, there are definitely sound design packs that you could purchase or you can record them from scratch. Um, if you're looking for sound design stuff, you know, um, Akash Thakar, Marshall McGee, if you heard of them. No, search them up. It's big, big help. But yeah, um, there's a, there's a lot of charm to recording your own sound effects. I'm not a sound designer, so I can't speak on that. But I know that um, you can definitely uh, purchase, as I mentioned, sample packs for sound design or music, and um, recording your own sounds has its own, as I said, has its own charm. And you can drag them into your digitality workstation, manipulate them, and then do all sorts of effects. Uh, the, the mixing lecture will take care of that sort of thing. Yeah, does that help at all? Yeah. Uh, can you just repeat the name of the people I should be searching? Oh, sure. Uh, Marshall? Marshall. McKee. McKee. Um, M C G E. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you want the other one? Uh, no. Okay. That, that's enough for you, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's another question, I believe. There's definitely another one somewhere. Oh, you. No. The boss. Yeah. Hey. So you mentioned for some of those samples. Yep. The yep. Recordings Round robins, yeah. Uh, how many of those do you think a high quality like library would have, or it is it vary depending on the sound and the instrument? No, no good answer. Um, okay, I'd say minimum four, because here's the thing: even if you have like ten round robins, if they all trigger in sequence, so one followed by the second one by the third, and they keep looping in that sequence without randomization, what happens is the ear will still pick up that pattern. Right, they'll figure out, hey, it loops every 10 times, and then it, that happens. So in contact, for instance, you could record your samples, and you could set, you know, round robin one, two, three, and four. Four you can get away with, but you definitely need to randomize it. 
So it's like it goes from the first sample, and it, by the second time you play it, it jumps to the third, the fourth, and goes back to the one, the second one. So it always confuses your ear. But obviously, the, the more round robins you have, the less randomization you need, but it's basically always uh, usually necessary. Some like uh, orchestral tools, you can choose whether to turn on the randomization, or you can turn on and off round robins. Like, you know, some samples, some round robins actually have are, uh, have, have something to the sample that you don't like, you can choose to turn it off. Um, but percussion libraries, because percussion, there's no pitch, right? I think it's because you're so focused on the sound itself that it becomes even easier to detect when it repeats. With percussion, right, there's so many notes that you're repeating in a rhythm. Uh, Damage 2, I believe, has, it's a, it's a percussion library by, uh, what was it, Heaviosity? Eight to ten round robins, I believe, up to ten. Some, I've seen 12 in some places, but it depends but no less than four, I'd say, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well, everyone seems a bit tired. I mean, I'm tired. How's the, how's the midterms going? That's a smile. I don't know if it's out of fear or, yeah, such is life. Um, you know, you'll, graduate eventually and hopefully but you know it's got to push through it and you'll get where you want to go I think uh, I think we'll conclude the lecture today if you want to come down and talk to me personally I'm willing to talk um, longer but if you have to go and we'll thank you very much for staying and yeah awesome. thank you I guess that's pretty much it. Thank oh, you all yeah, for coming. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, I will quickly say, though, uh, there are a lot of teams at UBC Game Dev that need a lot more music help. So uh, if you think you're interested in doing music for a team, or if you're already doing it for a team, but you want to help with another one, let me know right away, because we need a lot of help with that stuff. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. Oh, I forgot to use this as a pointer, because it kept glitching oh, yeah. out. I was like, yeah, unfortunate. <laughs>